you have your Bibles with you this morning, we ask that you turn to the book of Genesis, Genesis 15. Uh, while you're turning there, continue to remember uh, the, uh, the lost. They need our prayers the most. Genesis 15, and we're going to start reading in the very first verse. Genesis 15, in the first verse, the Bible says, After these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abraham in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram, I am thy shield, and thy exceeding great reward. And Abram said, Lord God, what wilt thou give me, seeing I go childless? And the steward of my house is this Eleazar of Damascus. And Abraham said, Behold, to me thou hast given no seed, and lo, one born in my house is mine, is mine heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, This shall not be the heir, be thine heir, but it shall come forth out of thine own bowels, shall be thine heir. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you and we praise you for all your goodness and your watch care. Lord, we thank your blessings on this church. We pray now that you would open your word to our hearts, Lord, and open our hearts to your word. Lord God, we pray that uh, the lost that meet, meet among us today, that they might be saved, Lord, that you might uh, open their stony hearts and that they might see the gospel and that the hope that they would have in you. We pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right, maybe some not so familiar verses of Scripture. Um, uh, it begins to talk really about the faith of Abram or Abraham. It begins to talk about God's plan. Now, the problem most of the time with the Lord's people is the same that Abram had in this day is trusting God's plan, trusting this word and this word alone Amen. because this is his plan. Amen. And that be it. Enough said, enough done. Uh, it begins in the first verse after these things. And so since it refers back to the the excerpt before us, we need to go back and see what things it's talking about. So now in Genesis 14, in verse 22, the Bible says, And Abram said, uh, and Abram said to the kingdom, to the king of Sodom, I lift, uh, I have lift up my hand unto the Lord, thy most, uh, thy most high God, the possessor of heaven and earth. Now, I want you to see that Abram had a very strong faith. Now, we'll see that his faith is tested and that we see that his faith grows. But even though it was strong, he lift up his hand and said, I have faith in God. Yeah. We'll see that it, didn't, it wasn't faith for everything. See, what we need to accept is God has a plan for every of our lives and he don't need our help. He don't need our help in gaining the end result. It belongs to him. And if it really belongs to him, we'll give him praise and not try to help him out. Uh, how many times have you tried to help the Lord out and how did that work out? See, uh, we, need to, we need to understand and know that uh, the Lord God of heaven has this thing in his hand and there's no problem. And so uh, uh, this king understood that. And the king of Sodom, the very city that would, that would go on rock, uh, I'm sorry, verse 22, and Abram said to the king of Sodom, I lift up my hand unto the Lord, the Most High God, the possessor of heaven and earth, that I will not take from uh, take a thread, even a shoe latchet, and that I will and that I will not take anything that is thine. Now, what had happened? The king had offered Abraham this large amount of money 
for delivering Sodom out of an enemy. He said, I'll pay you for it. I'll give you some money. Now, with that said, uh, Lot knew Sodom's hit. I mean, excuse me, uh, Abraham knew Sodom's history, and he knew the direction they were going, just like our next. Our nation's going in the very same direction where we marry men and men and women and women. And everybody says, hey, that's okay. And they were going in that direction. And Abram knew it. And he said, I don't want anything that you have. Right. Now, uh, with that said, you're talking about a 65, 75-year-old man still working to make a living. But he believed God. See, sometimes we want to work out our finances and depend on us when our only real dependence is on God. Amen. And so we find Abram had a level of faith when it comes to finances. He had a level of faith that he knew his God would let him and his people go hungry. He had a level of faith when it comes to the monetary things. You know what? That's an example to us. We don't even have that kind of faith most of the time. You know what? It never ceases to amaze me that we can put the trust of the only real thing that we have, our never dying soul, into the hands of the Almighty, but we won't give him our finances. I mean, that makes no sense whatsoever, does it? Because, see, these finances will soon pass. You know what? Worst case scenario, you lose everything you got. You know what? God's still God, and you're still saved. What, what, what difference does it make? And so we find then that Abram had that kind of faith when it comes to money, which is exceptional. Verse 23, that I will not, uh, excuse me, verse 24, save only that which the young men have eaten and the portion of the men which went with me, Aner, Eschol, and, uh, and Mamre, let them take their portion. Now, I want you to see these men he carried with them were working with him, but they were heathen people. See, heathen people, people that are not believers in Christ, They'll suck up money. That, that's, their, that's the only thing they understand. Uh, that's the only reward that they see in this life is what little bit that they can get a hold of. So he says, you let that bunch take theirs because they're heathen anyway, but I don't want your stuff. So we see that's the background. In other words, Abram, by this time an 80-year-old man, came home with a victory. You know what? Uh, isn't it a wonderful thing when you come home with a victory? Jared's fixing to go preach in a meeting and he showed me that list of people and yeah, I knew most of them. You know what, Jared? I hope you come home with a victory. And I believe you will if you trust God. And, and, and so we find this individual, Abraham, trusted God for his things and he trusted God with battle. Right. So we find two things that he unequivocally trusted God with. After these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abraham in a vision, saying, Fear not. Now, with the great victories that he'd already won, God says to him, Fear not. So the only thing I can come to is that Abraham still had some uncertainties in certain areas. Uh, I don't know what, the, well, we'll see in a minute what part of it was. I don't know if it was his health or his people or what out there scared him, but there must have been fear, and God knows our heart, so he recognized that fear, and he said, Hey, Abraham, hey, Abram, fear not. Don't, don't be upset about it. And you know what? And uh, we'll get down to the problem. So whatever problem you have this morning, whatever you're fearful of, even if you don't verbalize it, God knows. 
God knows. And, and so he says, Fear not, Abram, I am thy shield. So it must have been still something with battle. Because he said, I'm your shield. Don't, don't worry about the battle. And thy exceeding great reward. Now, I have to believe that the fearfulness wasn't necessarily battle. And we'll see, he begins to describe it. His fear was that there would be no air. Right. Yeah. His, his, his uncomfortableness was there was nobody to lead this to. Now, I think it's significant. I don't think even the inheritance was the money. I believe it was his relationship with God. How? Or because you remember, he was called out of the heathen. So he was a heathen before the Lord saved him. He was a heathen, and, and they worshipped false gods over there in his daddy's land, and his uncle, and, or his, uh, yeah, his uncle, and brought him out, and now... He's fearful that it would end. You know what? We don't have to worry about faith in God. Because he said, on this rock I will build my church. And the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Now, you know what? New Testament may slide out of existence one day. But there'll be somewhere, maybe we won't even know where it's out, a church still abiding in the faith. See, that wasn't an individual promise. That was, a, that was a general promise to all the churches. There will be one every day, every generation, always, somewhere, there will be a church. So Abram had a fear that it was going to end. And Abram said, Lord God, uh, what will thou give me, seeing I go childless? Now, that was another fear. He wanted to leave that faith to his family. And what a rich, wonderful blessing it is to see your faith go on to the next generation. I, I, I am blessed beyond measure that all three of my biological children and my young daughter, they're still in church here today. Me and Don have been married uh, almost 32 years, and God's helped us so much, and our boys are saved, serving the Lord somewhere. What could be better? See, he's been faithful to that, and Abram wanted that. And I can recognize that, can't you? Um, the only thing I can say in criticism of that, he thought he had to do it. See, you don't have to worry about the faith continuing. That's not your responsibility. And, and so we find then that uh, you, you pull away, and Abram's real fear was that it would not be passed on. And Abram said, Lord God, what wilt thou give me, seeing I go childless, and the steward of my house is this Eleazar of Damascus. Now, I want you to see Abram's plan was to give the physical inheritance to Eleazar. Now, what was the problem with giving it to Eleazar? Now, apparently Eleazar was a good businessman. Apparently Eleazar knew how to handle finances and keep the farm and keep the cattle. What was the issue? And why did Abram think this would be a good idea? He was looking at it from finances. He was looking at it, not the heritage of God going on, but the heritage of his farm. The heritage of him continuing financially. And that's really not a fear God's people ought to have. It's not something that, that is worth inheriting to anybody anyway. And so he suggested Eleazar. Now we'll have a problem of Damascus. Now in the New Testament... Damascus comes a, becomes a kind of a central of the faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and the faith of the churches. 
But in this day, Damascus was a heathen place, and that's where Eleazar came from. See, the best I understand, Eleazar was still a heathen. He didn't believe in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He did not believe in the truth of the Word of God. So why in this world would you leave your inheritance to a heathen? But you know what? I see people do it all the time. Yeah. They compromise. You know what? I understand New Testament's getting a little smaller and a little smaller. But you know what? I'm not going to give her to an Eleazar. Uh, I'm not going to compromise and say, hey, ladies, you can wear what you want. Men, you knew what you want to do and, and fill the building up. Because you know what? When that comes, if you compromise one thing of the Word of God, you'll have to keep compromising and keep compromising until, listen, there's nothing left. You know how a church dies? I've often thought about that. Why do churches die? The main reason is compromise. Yeah. The main reason, uh, listen, is somebody uh, saying, hey, we'll allow this in so we can grow in numbers. Man, I would rather this morning grow in faith than grow in numbers, wouldn't you? Mm -hmm. Grow in understanding than growing in numbers. And so we find that uh, one of his fears was inheritance. Verse 3. And Abram said, Behold, to me thou hast given no seed, and lo, one born in my house is mine heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, This is not thine heir. That is the wrong plan. Eleazar's not going to have it. Eleazar's not even a believer. Eleazar is not my plan. That's your plan. You know, what sad thing when we overt the, the, permiss uh, the perfect will of God for the permissive will of God. You ever wonder how many people spend the entirety of their life in the permissive will of God? Never digging in, never studying enough, and saying, you know what, I just can't make it on my own. I've got to do this, and I've got to do that. No, no. Stick with the book. Uh, Stick with the Word of God. And, and you'll be all right. So we find that the first plan was not a good plan because he was handing it over to a heathen. He was handing it over to somebody that didn't even appreciate the Word of God, that did not embrace what truth was. That was not God's plan. It was Abraham's plan. And behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, this shall not be thine heir, but he, meaning the true heir, shall come forth out of thine own bowels, and uh, thy own bowels shall be thine heir. And he brought him forth abroad and said, Look, how, look now toward heaven, and tell the stars if thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, So shall thy seed be. Now, that is not the promise, it's the renewal of the promise, because he done told him this one before, and, and he didn't believe it, and that's why he came up with this bright, bright idea, we'll accomplish God's plan together, and I'll leave this to Eleazar. But God said, now you look, Abraham, let's spend it night time. He said, can you number all those stars up there? Can you tell me the summation of them? He says, that will be like your inheritance. That will be the number of your people. And, and so he renewed. You know what? We need a renewal sometime, don't we? Every once in a while, it's a good thing when God meets with his people and he stirs us up a little bit and we remember those blessed truths that he's still on the throne and he's over Corona and he's over the rest and nothing nothing outside his will has ever, ever came to pass. Yeah. So he reminds, he reminds Abraham and said, now look, remember what I told you. That's going to be your people. That's going to be your nation. Don't stress out, Abraham. We got, I've got a plan. Genesis 16.
Genesis 16, in the very first verse, the Bible says, Now Sarai, Abram, Abram's wife, bare him no children, and she had an, a, a handmaid, an Egyptian, whose name was Hagar. Now, I, when you first look on the horizon, I see a problem with Hagar because she's an Egyptian. You know what that means? She's right in that branch with Eleazar. She don't believe truth. She's not one of God's elect. She is not a Jewish person. She does not understand God. And that's their plan B. They already went through plan A, and now it's going to be Eleazar. Mm -hmm. Now, plan B is a, as a child by a bond woman who's an Egyptian. Yeah. See, God don't need your help, does he? No. And every plan that we come up with is always filled with stupidity. <laughs> it's like saying the little sinner's prayer, ain't it? That, that, that's an Eleazar plan. That, that, that's a Hagar plan. Because you know what? Your little sinner's prayer is not in the Word of God. It's come up by man's thinking. We better watch what we think. Mm -hmm. Just go with that book. You know what? It may not even make sense to us. It may not even been what we've taught since we're that high. But go with the book. Yeah. Go with the book. And, and so we find that apparently Abram ain't learned his lesson. And so now he's got another idea. And Sarai, Abram's wife, bare him no children. And she had a handmaid, an Egyptian, whose name was Hagar. And Sarai said unto Abram, Behold now, the Lord hath restrained me from bearing. I pray thee, go in unto my maid, and it may be that I may obtain children by her. And Abram hearkened to the voice of Sarai. Now, I see two problems. Uh, first of all, his wife's running the mouth and taking the driver's seat. <coughs> And you remember what happened in the Garden of Eden when that, when that little transpire happened before? And now we see it all repeated. And Sarai got in the driver's seat and said, Now, Abram, we're going to fix the problem. But oh, what a mess it made, don't it? Mm -hmm. well, you know what? We're still paying for that mess that Sarai started. Uh, <laughs> 4,000 years ago. Look to Iraq. See, we're, 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 still, we're still paying for Sarah's mistake, aren't we? And, and, and so we find that <laughs> it seemed in man's idea a solution, but it wasn't God's solution. And Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar, her handmaid, uh, the Egyptian after Abram dwelt ten years in the land of Canaan. So they did wait ten years on God's promise. That's longer than we do. And, uh, and gave her to her husband Abram to be his wife. And he went unto Hagar and she conceived. And when she, meaning Sarai, saw that she, meaning Hagar, had conceived, uh, her mistress was despised in her eyes. See, the result that they got made Sarai mad. You know what? We deal with the results of our sin the rest of our life, don't we? We really do. And, and that, when it came to pass, what she thought would be a good solution, and they'd have an heir through the Egyptian woman, when it came to pass, she saw the mistake. You know, uh, how many times in your own life after, after what bright idea you had and you worked it all out and then you see what a horrible mistake it was? See, that was the position that Abram and Sarai were in right now. And we'll see that will be a problem for years to come. And so, you know, the rest, she gives birth to Ishmael and... Has and uh, she never and they never. Well, let me say this: Hey, uh, Sarai never uh, accepts it. Uh, 
Verse 6, Abram said unto Sarai, Behold, thy handmaid is in thy hand. Go to her as it pleaseth. And when Sarai dealt hardly with her, she fled from her face. And so what happened is Sarah kind of rebuked um, Hagar when it was her fault to start with. Now I want to go to Genesis 17. Genesis 17 Beginning in verse 15. Genesis 17 and verse 15. And God said unto Abraham, As for Sarai thy wife, she shall not be called her name Sarai, but Sarah shall her name be. Now I'm not exactly sure. I think Sarai means servant. And Sarah means princess. She's, she's going from a servant to a princess. Don't call her Sarai anymore. That's her name. See, uh, uh, despite what she had done, God still blessed her. Isn't that a wonderful truth this morning? I think about the stupid things I've done as a young man, and even the stupid things I've done as a middle-aged man, and I'm amazed at the goodness of God that He's still blessing me, that He still helps me every day, no matter when I foul up, no matter when the trouble comes in, that my God is still blessing me. And so despite the issue, despite Sarah's little plan B, she says, I'm going to turn her into a princess. I'm going to turn her into a queen of nations. She's going to be she's going to be special in my sight despite everything she's done. I love her and she's mine. And so he makes her this problem. And I will bless her, uh, verse 16 again, even though she didn't deserve it, and I will bless her and give thee a son also of her, yea, I will bless her, and she shall be the mother of nations, kings of people shall be of her. God's plan restated. Not only was God's plan restated, now he ups the ante and says, you know what? In addition to her having a child, she's going to be the mother of kings, the mother of many nations. She's going to be in hot spot. Then I want you to see the reaction. Then Abraham fell upon his face and laughed and said in his heart, you better be careful about what you say in your heart because God knows. <laughs> and he said in his heart, Shall a child be born unto him that is a hundred years old? And shall Sarah, which is ninety years old, bear? And Abraham said unto God, Oh, that Ishmael might live before thee. Now, I want you to see Abraham still did not possess total faith because he says, First of all, he laughs at God's plan. Now listen, being in health care for literally all my life, I've met very few people that was 100 years old plus. Now I've met, I've met a lot compared to most people. But you know what i found when people get that old? They're very, very fragile. We had a lady over at the nursing home that passed Friday night, 97. And she, she would always look so fragile. Uh, when you went into the room to care for her, you just took extra gentleness because she, she just looked so fragile. And now God's promise is this. Somebody in that state of fragileness is going to be a father and a brand new mama. Would you believe that? Think about a hundred. Anybody else know somebody was a hundred? Think about them being a father. Women that are 90 literally giving birth again. You know what? We get down on Abram, Abraham, but it's pretty comical to me too. You just get honest with yourself. So what was Abram's spiritual problem? It was faith. He really, not yet, did not believe God. 
Now, you know what? Sometimes when I get down and out and get discouraged, what I need is a booster shot of my faith. And remember, he's on the throne, and nothing, nothing, nothing interferes with that. And so this is God's plan for their life. It's not plan B, it's plan A. But Ishmael was not God's chosen, but it was plan C. So we've had, we've had Eleazar, we've had given him a son. Remember, that was Sarah's plan. That son was Ishmael, and now Abraham has picked up plan C. I know we can fix this. You know what? When a church is going down, or you're going down spiritually, you know this is it. You can't fix it. Yeah. You cannot fix it. But God can. Go before him in prayer and have faith. You know, you know, just like Abram, our biggest problem here in 2020 is a lack of faith. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If God said it, I believe it. May not understand it, but I believe it. Ever thought about the catching a wave? I've heard sermons on that all my life. And have you ever thought about it actually happening? What it looks like? What will be the sight of graves bursting open? People ascending? You know, that's, that takes a lot of faith to really believe that. Right. And so we find then that often we have the very same problem that Abram, Abraham had. We kind of laugh at the plan of God and come up with our own plan. Verse 19, And God said, Sarah, thy wife shall bear thee a son indeed. In other words, it's my plan. This is what we're going to do. Sarah's going to have a son indeed. And thou shalt call his name Isaac. And I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant and with his seed, not Ishmael's, with his seed after him. As for this Ishmael, I've heard thee, and behold, I've blessed him. Now, apparently, all this time, and these, uh, for the, the, them boys were 16 years apart. If you, if you follow your Bible, he was 84 when Ishmael was born, and he was 100 when Isaac was born. Apparently, all this time, he'd been praying for Ishmael. Yeah. Now, you know, that's not a bad thing. I try to pray for my children every day. But I sure don't want to pray them out of the will of God. You know what God does with them is his business. Remember Hannah? She took that baby up there, made this promise to God, said, if you'll give me a son, I'll give him, I'll give him to you all the days of, her, of his life. And that's exactly what she did. She followed up with her promise and she trusted God that God was able and that he would take care of all the and, ifs, and buts that he knew Samuel's will better than she did. See, that's, that's, a, big, that's a big, big thing. When you know God's will for you is better than your will for yourself. And, and so we find then that Abraham is, is still getting this message. It's the very same message that he's received now for over 20 years. Because remember, this started before Ishmael was born. Ishmael is now 16. And we still get the same very problem. And the same very problem is faith. You scared of uh, Corona? Doctor, your faith a little bit. You scared they're going to make us quit meeting because public assemblies are shut are shutting down all over this land. Watch your faith. You know, you know uh, the old covenant that we had, and I, I didn't see a lot of biblical stuff in it, so we chucked it. Do you remember that? But one of those promise, uh, 
uh, would say that we would meet together. And probably that was one of the most biblical aspects of the Philadelphia Confession of Faith. Because the Lord said, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together. What did they tell us that? Are we going to go with that or are we going to go with God? You see what I'm saying? Just because the government says it doesn't make it so. Uh, yeah. They said men could marry men and women could marry women. Listen, that don't make it so, does it? And, and so we see that maybe in the next few days, the next few weeks, we may have some decisions to make. And are we going with God's plan or are we going with the government's plan? See, it takes faith to say, hey, you know what? I don't care what you say. New Testament's meeting somewhere every Sunday. Takes a little bit of faith, doesn't it? And, and so we find the very, very same situation still going on in Abraham's life. Verse 20. As for Ishmael, I've heard thee. Behold, I've blessed him and will make him fruitful and will multiply him exceedingly. Twelve princes shall he beget, and I will make him a great nation. Now, there's your trouble today. Still your trouble. Last place, Genesis 21. Genesis 21, in the very first verse, the Bible says, And the Lord visited Sarah. Isn't it a wonderful thing, time, just to spend a little time with the Lord? Yeah. I want you to see, the Bible says the Lord visited her and not the other way around. Sarah didn't visit the Lord. The Lord visited her. See, when he shows up, he don't matter what we're doing. It's a great blessing. You know what? Three or four people that cannot seem that good anyway, and God shows up. Listen, that's good enough for the praise of our Lord. So I want him to visit us and not on the flip side. Right? I want him to come down and manifest himself to us in a great and wonderful way despite everything that's going on in this world around us. And the Lord visited Sarah as he had said, and the Lord did unto Sarah as he had spoken. See, God's faithful, is he not? He finally, after 20 plus years, he keeps his promise. He initiates his plan. And you know, oh, what a wonderful thing that it was that he did wait that long because when he, when he waited that long, it was all of God. See, a lot of people don't realize this, but down through the years, there's been a lot of elderly women, what I would consider, you know, take that back, uh, what I would consider later women having babies. There was a queen in England that had a natural child at 72. And others, many, many at 65. And so when we look at that, who could have attributed, what, what would the natural man attribute that event to if she did it? Because we know when they hit it out, she was 65. They would say it's just a fluke. Yeah. I've seen that before. I've heard about that. I, I, I've read history books. That's not the only time that's happened. But listen, she's the only 90-year-old woman that's ever had a child, and she still is today. See, God will be lifted up in his plan. He won't be lifted up in man's plan, but he'll lift, be lifted up in his own plan. And that is certainly where we ought to take our spot is simply abiding in God's plan. It may take years, it may, it, it may take uh, decades, but abide in God's plan. Don't give up, don't give in, don't come up with your own grand ideas, just believe God. For Sarah, verse 2, for Sarah conceived and bare Abraham a son in his old age, now, if you underline in your Bible, get this, at the set time. You know what a set time is? It's where you say, okay, 
we're going to meet on Sundays at 10 a.m. We've set time. See, somewhere way back there in eternity, God said, Sarah's going to have a, a, a man child when she's 90. Abraham, of course, will be at 100 because, see, he, he offered their birth times too. And he says, at the set time, when God's plan was on the scene, then it finally happened. You know what? And they had waited by this point. You just think, she was 65 when they left, and now she's 90. That's 35 years. That's a long time time to wait. That, that's more than half my life. 35 years ago, I was 17. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? But is that a long time to God? No. So, wait on Him. Wait on His plan. Uh, and what, 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 how can we do that? Hey, that's the only way thing I know to tell you. That's the only way I can tell you to work it out is have faith in God. You know what? It, it really, when, when you have true faith in God, having faith in God's plan is no longer an issue, is it? Because you have faith. He offered it. His design, his way he set it up. And so if you have faith in him, you know it must be right. And that's what we need to do. Verse 4, And Abraham circumcised his son Isaac, being eight days old, as God had commanded him. And Abraham was a hundred years old when his son Isaac was born unto him. And Sarah said, God hath made me laugh, so that all that hear will laugh with me. See, uh, you, know, you know when you laugh, it's when you're happy, is it not? See, God manifested him, his plan in Sarah's life as well, did he not? See, just wait on the Lord. You know, we sing the song, wait on the Lord and be of good courage. And what? He will strengthen your soul. You know what? I, I really think doubting God and coming up with plan B on our own It'll destroy our faith, won't it? Yeah. It will take us down to nothing spiritually. So don't go with Eleazar. Don't go with Hagar. Don't go with Ishmael. Go with God. That's all we need, is it not? Accepting God's plan and, and, and having faith because he said so.